So does anybody know what today is? Veterans Day. Veterans Day. And in fact, not only is it Veterans Day, but what time does that class start? Yeah. It starts at 11. And so you know, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918 is when armistice happened in World War II. So for probability, I actually did the German tank problem. Today. For today, I figured we should do something in complex analysis. And so how many of you took cryptography with me? Okay, just for the... Uh, so, okay, so I don't mind boring just for the... So the following is, I think, one of my favorite examples of deducing an enormous amount of information from a very small, clever idea. So in World War II, one of the huge advantages the Allies had over the Axis powers is we had cracked a lot of their codes. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, the Pacific War was not going well for the U.S. The Japanese had naval superiority. They had six aircraft carriers to only four for the U.S. The first major U.S. victory was the Battle of Midway. And the Japanese decided to do a surprise attack on Midway using four of the aircraft carriers. One of the reasons they did this was because of the successful Doolittle raid on Tokyo, where the Japanese thought that the Americans did not have the ability to reach Tokyo to attack it. What we did is I think we took B-25 bombers and somehow launched them from an aircraft carrier. They were supposed to be... It was like a sneaky aircraft carrier. Yeah, I mean, you were not supposed to be able to do this. The planes were taking off literally with just a few feet to spare from the end of the carriers. A Japanese ship actually spotted the B-25s heading towards Tokyo and radioed, and headquarters said, you know, whatever you're drinking, stop. You know, there's no way B-25s, they don't have the range from where the U.S. bases are. They can't be hitting Tokyo. The pilots did not have enough fuel to actually return back to U.S. bases. And a lot of them were captured by the Japanese. Some crashed in China, some crashed in the sea. Once a year, the survivors of the Doolittle Raid still meet. Uh, this happened a few days ago to celebrate uh, the successful attack. But the Japanese were just furious that they had been attacked in Tokyo. And so they decided to continue the offensive, and they decided to attack Midway. The problem was, even though we had cracked their code, you still use codes within codes. And the Japanese talked about how they were going to attack AF. And you know, Admiral Halsey's you know, crypto staff was pretty sure that AF meant Midway, but they weren't 100% sure. And if we decide to put all of our forces to defend Midway and attack the Japanese when they do their surprise attack, if we guess wrong and the Japanese attack Australia, uh, the West Coast, Hawaii, it could be devastating. So one solution, of course, is to call up the Japanese and say, you know, excuse me, we're having some trouble. We've decrypted most of your message. But we're not quite sure. Does AF mean midway? And so obviously this idea was vetoed. And so what the U.S. did was, in my mind, one of the most ingenious ideas in the history of the world to try to figure out what AF meant. So what they did is they told their base at midway in a very secure channel to break one of their water pumps. And then, in one of the low-priority messages that was going out later, to just announce, among a bunch of other items, that you know, their water pump was broken, and if they don't get a replacement water pump, they'll be out of fresh water in two weeks. In an intercepted Japanese message, they were talking about all the different U.S. messages they've overheard. And they reported that Base AF has a broken water pump, and will be out of fresh water in two weeks. And so Nimitz then went all in. And he decided to put uh, three U.S. aircraft carriers into the battle. Uh, one of them was actually badly damaged, and they were just rushing to get it there for the planes. Uh, we lost that carrier in the battle, but that was the only aircraft carrier we lost. The Japanese lost four aircraft carriers. After the battle, we had aircraft superiority. It was you know, the turning point in the war in the Pacific. And so I realize it's not entirely directly related to what we're doing with complex analysis. But it is a damn clever idea. It's Veterans Day. One of the big themes of this course is looking at problems the right way. How do you find, in some sense, the right way to multiply by one? How do you find the right way to reorganize things and to really glean what's going on? You know, that's the whole idea. You want to glean what's going on with as little work as possible. And this was just a phenomenally effective way to figure out what the Japanese were up to. Okay. Shifting gears greatly, back to the realm of Fourier analysis. Okay, so we need the Dirichlet kernel. So dn of x is the sum, and goes minus n to n, of en of x 
and it turns out this is the same as the sine of 2n plus 1 pi x divided by the sine of pi x. And we need the Feyer kernel. I forget where his accent mark goes. Does anybody remember where Feyer goes? Is it the first D or the second D? I will split the difference. We'll put it over the J. I have the Feyer kernel, <laughs> Fn of x. And if the French had done better in World War II, I'd be more than that. Alright, uh, n goes from 0 to n minus 1, dn of x, and this is sine squared of n pi x over n sine squared pi x. Okay, these two kernels are going to be extremely useful. Whose theorem do you think the Feyer kernels are going to be used for? Feyer's theorem. theorem. right. Dirichlet's theorem is going you know, for convergence of Fourier series is going to relate to the Dirichlet kernels. Which kernel do you think is easier to use? And again, for kernel K, you often look at maybe f k of x would be the integral from say zero to one of f of t k of x minus t dt, or equivalently the integral from zero to one of f of x minus t, k of t, dt. So what this is, is this is a transformation. You start off with a function f, it gives you a new function related to the original. And it comes from integrating your function against a kernel. All right, so we call the function we're integrating against the kernel, and we denote the operator somehow with some letter related to the function we're integrating with respect to. So I have two different kernels I can integrate with respect to. I can integrate with respect to the Dirichlet kernel or the Feyer kernel. Which kernel is better and why? The Feyer kernel goes to zero. So it goes to uh, okay. So where does the Feyer kernel go to zero? Everywhere. Everywhere? I don't think the fate, I don't think it goes to zero everywhere. Oh, wait. Oh. Wait, what? X is not. Half time. Wait, sign is zero. <laughs> but X is not integer. So what's what's the first value of X I should try things at? Zero. 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 So if I try zero, uh, basically, you know. Sine squared pi x is going to look like you know pi squared x squared. This is going to look like n squared pi squared x squared. The pi squared x squareds cancel. n squared over n. This is going to look like n. So near x equals zero, this is exploding. What about away from x equals zero? What happens? What does this look like away from x equals zero? It goes to zero. It goes to zero. Sine squared up top is bounded by one. And as long as x is not 0 or 1, I'm not going to have the sign of 0 and the n in the denominator. So I have something that looks like it's shooting up to 1 at 0 and is 0 everywhere else. So if I want to sketch it, going from minus a half to a half is a little bit more convenient than 0 to 1. It's going to look maybe, there should be some kind of oscillations, something like this. It's non-negative, because I have squares. It's going to 0 everywhere except at the origin. What does this look like? Delta Looks like a delta function or an approximation to the identity. This is why the Feyer kernel is so easy and so nice to work with, because it's an approximation to the identity. What about the Dirichlet kernel? Is that a nice kernel? Is, is there an issue with the picture? or? No, it just looks like something. It should. <laughs> right? Part of this whole point is to give you guys stuff that you've seen in physics. <coughs> right? What about the Dirichlet kernel? I mean, we've seen three kernels or heard about three kernels today. Doolittle, Feyer, and now Dirichlet. 
why is this not a good kernel? Or what issues does this kernel have? It's like it goes, it, it's bounded by one when x gets really large, but we don't know that it goes to zero. Well, do you think it goes to zero? No. no. So this kernel does not have good cancellation. It also has another bad property. So not only are we losing decay, and I'm actually worried right now that I might have a typo here, because I thought there should be some decay in the, maybe not. Um, What's the other issue with the Dirichlet kernel? Nothing else looks bad about this? Oh, okay. The Dirichlet kernel... Okay, I don't have the one on the inside. Okay. What it can is... be negative. I'm sorry. It can be negative. Okay. And now with negative, I can have things canceling for bad reasons. Mm -hmm. So it turns out analysis involving the Dirichlet kernel is a lot harder than analysis involving the Fayette kernel. The fair kernel is an approximation to the identity. When I integrate something with an approximation to the identity, in the limit, all that really matters is my value at the origin. So the first thing you have to do is prove these theorems. So if we can get this theorem, we can then get this theorem. This is something basically where you're always told you should go off and do it, and almost nobody ever goes off and does it. But at least tell me, how would I prove that this sum equals that? What could I use? I'm sorry? How would I get this equals this? What, what kind of sum is this? I'm sorry? Okay, it's a finite sum. It's kind of like a Fourier sum, but what sums can you evaluate? There's not that many sums. I, I can only think of two sums that most of you can evaluate exactly. Geometric. Geometric and? Constant. Constant or arithmetic regression. <laughs> right? Essentially, these are the two sums you can evaluate. If I give you, you know, 1, 4, 7, 10, I expect you to be able to handle something like that. Maybe if I give you powers of n, you should be able to get that. The only other thing we can really do is geometric. Is this a geometric sum? Yeah. It is. What's the ratio? The ratio is E1 of x. So, geometric. ratio is e1 of x. Because right, as I go from n to n plus 1, I put another e to the 2 pi i x. So I have a geometric series. With some algebra, I should be able to get this. The question is, what's the best way to do the algebra? Maybe what I do is I go from 0 to n, and I double that, and I subtract off the n equals 0 term, because I've now double counted that. And maybe that's a good way to do it. Maybe I should notice that because I have n and negative n, things are canceling, and I'm only getting either the real part or the imaginary part, something like that. You know, it's good algebra to see, can you prove this? All right, now that we have that, now we want to sum that and get this. What kind of sum is this? And the hint is, it's a sum that we can do, so it must be a sum that we know. It's got to be a geometry <laughs> again, right? That's the only possibility. Well, the pi, sine pi x doesn't change, so that's no problem. Now we get the sine of 2n plus 1 pi x. Oh, I can write that as e to the something minus e to the negative something. And then divide by 2i. So I can write this as a difference of two exponentials and play games. Okay. So I go through sketches of this in the chapter. It's good exercise for you to do this at one point in your life. And so we'll assume you've now all done that in the last you know, half second and move on. Okay? So to show that this is an approximation to the identity, how many things do we have to show? Three. We've done two of them. It's non-negative. And if you fix x and you move a little bit away from the origin, as n gets large, it goes to zero. So there's only one last thing to show. What's the last thing to show? Integrates to one. It integrates to 1. If you look at what goes on, every dn term includes e0. I have n of these terms, so I have e0 n times. The interval e0 is just 1. So when I integrate e0, I get 1. Great. Every other term is going to be an e sub n where n is not 0, 
And what's the integral of e sub n if n is not zero? Zero. So that's the proof that it integrates to one. Is essentially the coefficient in front of e zero is uh, one, and the coefficient in front of everything else doesn't matter because it integrates to zero. So it is an approximation to the identity. Approximation to the identity. Now, if you remember, we've talked about Fourier series here. They're the sum of f hat of n, e n of x. So when I calculate these integrals, this should be related to sums of Fourier coefficients. So let's do the Fayer one and see what we're getting there. And then I'll leave the dear side to you. So Fayer. So we'll call T and F of x the integral. I'll write it minus a half to a half because really zero is the special point. And I want to just have the wrap around like that. Okay? So it'll be f of x, f n of x dx. I'm sorry. f of t, f n of x, uh, x minus t dt. <coughs> do I want to do an integral like this? Yeah, sure, why not? All right, there's you know, two different ways I could do this. I could have it as either f of t or f of x minus t. Let's see what we get. So we'll get the integral from minus a half to a half, f of t, and now we get a 1 over n, and then a sum, n goes from 0 to n minus 1, dn of x, so it's going to be a sum, um, n goes from minus n to n, of e m of x minus t, dt. Right. When I put in what does the Dirichlet term equal? So I want to keep track how often, you know, for each choice of n, do I have an en? Yes, did I make a mistake? Uh, is that f of t? That's f of t. That's the thing. So how often do I have the term e0? I have it once in this sum, but I have it for every n. So how often do I get e0? n times, n times divided by n. <coughs> so e0, I get n times. What about e1? How often do I get e1? n minus 1 times. The only time I don't get it is when n equals 0. And of course, that would also be e minus 1. What about e2? How many times? Don't you get more, like n plus 1? <clears throat> For each choice of n, I get e1 unless n equals 0, in which case I don't get it. So the total number of times I get e1 is n minus 1. I've lost e1 only when n equals 0. So what about e2? How often do I get e2? n minus 2. n minus 2. And so the pattern continues. And so I can actually write this in a much better way as the integral from minus a half to a half f of t, and then it's going to be n minus n over n e n of x minus t dt. And of course, I'm going to just pull out the sum right now. n goes from minus n to n. Why can I pull out the sum? Finite. It's finite, right? I have a finite sum, and since it's a finite sum, no problem. Now, one thing to note is e n of x minus t is e to the two pi i n x minus t dt. So I can write this as e n of x, e n of negative t. Right? So what I can do now <coughs> is I have a sum, n goes from minus n to n, an integral minus a half to a half, <coughs> f of t, 
n minus n over n, e n of x, e n of minus t, dt. Ah, but if I take the integral and this and this, and if I do those three things, what do those three things give me? They give me f hat where? What do you mean by f hat? Yeah. Well, so if I, I can write this as uh, the sum, n goes from minus n to n. I can pull out an n minus n over n. I can pull out, I'll, I'll put in the integral here, minus one half one half e, f of t e to the negative two pi i n t dt e n of x. What is that bracketed quantity? It's f half at what point? T. Can't be t. Why can't it be t? Because it's only not the integers. Mm. Well, t could be an integer, but there's a, there's a reason why it can't be t. What am I integrating with respect to? I'm integrating with respect to t. So I can't have any t dependence. I've done the integration with respect to t. What is it? It's f hat where? If it's a half or zero or a half. No. No. You mean it's n, but is it n plus or minus or half or just n? No, f hat of n. All that matters is that you know, everything is periodic. So it doesn't matter if I integrate from 0 to 1 or minus a half to a half. This is just f hat of n. So notice this looks almost like a Fourier series. It's the sum, n goes from minus n to n, n minus n over n, f hat of n, e n of x. So if it wasn't for this factor, it would have been the Fourier series. And this is why the Fourier series are a little bit trickier to work with in some sense, but a lot nicer in another sense, is reattach these weights. And so not all Fourier coefficients are weighted equal. Which Fourier coefficients are weighted more? The lower ends. The lower ones. The lower ends are weighted more. Okay. Now, as big N grows, then you have larger and larger regions of Fourier coefficients that are essentially equally weighted. And in the limit, point-wise, what do these things seem to be going to? Just the Fourier series. Just the Fourier series, right? But of course, as you get larger, more frequencies come up far down the line. So this turns out to be significantly easier to work with in terms of convergence issues. Okay? And so, hopefully this motivates why one would like to study Fayer series. Fayer series are very close cousins to Fourier series. The only difference are these weights here. Well, rather than using the Fayer kernel, what would be another kernel to use? The Dirichlet kernel. The Dirichlet kernel. What do you think would happen if we use the Dirichlet kernel? What would you conjecture? We'd have an issue of convergence. We'd have an issue of convergence, but what would the final answer be? It probably wouldn't be exactly this. What would change if we use the Dirichlet series? The Dirichlet kernel. No weighting. No weighting. So essentially, this weighting is come from the fact that we are weighting the Dirichlet series. So we're weighting the Dirichlet kernel, right? Not surprisingly, if you introduce weights, you've introduced weights. Okay. Deep fact. So the question is, why do we want to introduce the weights? The weights will help make convergence issues easier. Okay, any questions about this? I want to try to keep all the Dirichlet kernel and Fayer kernel definitions on the board. I know this isn't fair to Umang, but you know, we could have chosen to come here. Okay? I want to erase this. Is everybody happy with this stuff over here? So what we want to do is we want to see what does this converge to? And so I want to look at what happens as n gets very large and we need to decide what class of functions to look at. So, for simplicity, I will assume f is continuous and periodic.
and because I'm not a moron, I will assume it's periodic with period 1. You know, periodic with period square root 2 would be useless for us for this problem. Whenever we say periodic, it's always periodic with period equal to the length we're studying. And so Faye's theorem says that Tn of f converges uniformly to f. So Faye's theorem, f as above, Tn of f converges uniformly to f as n tends to infinity. Okay, so we can either prove phase theorem first and then look at consequences, or we can do consequences first and then do phase theorem. I'm indifferent. Consequences. consequences. So consequence. Weierstrass's theorem. How many of you have heard of Weierstrass's theorem? That any any continuous function can be uniformly approximated by polynomials. Any continuous function can be uniformly approximated by polynomials. I'll say any continuous, to be safe, I'll say periodic. Any continuous function can be Did I give you a proof of this in one of the additional comments? Where we explicitly constructed that? I, remember. I can't remember if I did that in this class or probably later this year. If, if I have, I'll, I'll, I'll put it back up. There's a direct way to prove Weierstrass's theorem. You do not have to go through Faye's theorem to get to Weierstrass's theorem. But if you happen to be in a class where Faye's theorem was just proved, you can get Weierstrass's theorem in one line. So we know we can approximate our function uniformly as n goes to infinity with these Faye series. So. Consider Tn of f of x. What kind of function is this? Does it involve square roots? Does it involve hyperradicals? Hypergeometrics. What kind of function is Tn of f? Yes. It's going to have something. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to just involve sines and cosines or exponentials. So this is just sines, cosines, or exponentials. Can you approximate sine or cosine very well with a polynomial? Yeah. Yes. What do you do? With your yeah. Tailor experiment. Right? Deal with epsilons. Right. I'm not going to deal with the epsilons, okay? But what you basically do is look, I can approximate sine extremely well with its Taylor series. So you just tell me how close I need to approximate it. And that's going to depend on how many terms I have. <coughs> So maybe what I'll do is for each one, I'll approximate it so well that it'll be at least, it'll be at most epsilon over 2n plus 1 away from the true value. Yes? Will this be able to exhaustively cover every continuous periodic function, the tn of f? Yes. You give me any periodic continuous function and I can do this. Now, it's not necessarily going to give me a unique way of doing this. You know, I could, you know depending on how I choose to approximate things. But I will get a good, but I will get an approximation, and I can make the approximation as good as I want. You might have to be a little bit careful because when you have these sines and cosines, remember they have weights <coughs> in front of them. But if I do everything in terms of the exponentials, what are the weights you get in the phase series? N minus n over n. I'm sorry. It's n minus n over n. So where do these weights live? Between yeah, between zero and one. So the weights aren't that bad. <coughs> So in terms of how much I have to multiply these by, oh good, I'm multiplying by a number at most one in absolute value. That's not bad. So if I want to be close, I take one of my exponential functions and I approximate it extremely well. If I were to multiply it by n factorial, that's bad, that grows. 
but I'm multiplying it by something that's at most one in absolute value. So for each term, I tailor expand so well that my area is at most epsilon over the number of terms plus one. And then when I combine them all up, my error will be at most epsilon. Okay. So this is bias process theory. You know, it's not a bad idea to just you know, go through and write it up rigorously, but this is a nice consequence. In some sense, this is a stupid consequence, right? The whole point is the sines and the cosines have better convergence properties than the Taylor series. Right? Why am I going backwards into Taylor series? Well, it's just to get a classical result. You know, not surprisingly, before people had sines and cosines, or thought of using sines and cosines, they tried to do things in terms of 1x, x squared, x cubed. It's nice to see that you can reduce these. But there are better ways, if you only care about Weierstrass's theorem, to get to Weierstrass directly. Right. So this is just one of the many nice consequences of phase theorem. In a lot of the work I do on Benford's law of digit bias, uh, phase theorem plays a really nice role. Okay. Uh, so in the interest of space, I'm going to just erase the statement of Fayette's theorem, and I'm going to just start the proof. So the proof I'm about to show you has a very special name in real analysis. There's a name for these types of proofs. Does anybody remember the name of this one? Nope. Epsilon over 3 proof. <laughs> this, yes. <laughs> if, you, if you do it like that, I have to break this into thirds. Can you do it another way? Uh, three epsilon. Three epsilon. Yeah. Yeah. How many did you get? One. <laughs> you got epsilon. Novice. So, again, if you're trying to showboat, you, you just think so that at the end of the day you end up and you show it. it's less than epsilon. After a while, you realize that there's no need to have it less than epsilon. If you can show it's less than 3 epsilon, that's good enough. And so they typically call these the 3 epsilon proofs. Okay? And so what we want to do is we want to show that f of x minus tn f of x is small. And we want to show that this is independent of the point x. So you know, given an epsilon, we have to find an n such that for all n greater than n, uh, f of x minus t and f of x is less than epsilon. Right. And so, I think for Weierstrass, I'm sorry, for Faye I do it one way, for Dirichlet I do it the other way. It doesn't really matter which way we do it. Um, okay, so I did t and f of x minus f of x. I just want to write it in the same way as in the book. When you look at t and f of x, what is this really? How do we calculate this? <coughs> I'm sorry? We do an integral. <coughs> this is just evaluating the function. I want to put them on the same setting. Is there an integral I can put in here? What kind of integral can I put in there? Approximation to the identity. Yes. And so if I... And if I have an approximation to the identity, I get the integral from minus a half to a half, f, and I'm going to write this as x minus t, fn of t dt, minus f of x, integral from minus a half to a half, fn of t dt. And I'm writing it like this because it's an approximation to the identity, it integrates to 1. And now I have two integrals that I can work with. <coughs> and if you notice, I'm not writing this the same as I did up here. The reason is I'm writing this as fn of t, so I want this to be fn of t as well. So I'm using the fact that I can use either definition for the convolution. And if you haven't seen that before, you can just do a change of variables, replace um, you know, x minus t with u, and then just propagate and see what happens. All right, so now, this is the integral from minus a half to a half, f of x minus t minus f of x times fn of t dt. So for what values of t do I have issues? 
When is the analysis easy? When is the analysis hard? Okay, so in some sense, t equals zero is good because I don't have f of x minus f of x. So, yay, t equals zero is good here, but tan Stoffel. Tan Stoffel? Who knows what tan Stoffel is? I'm sorry? There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Email me. Right, good cultural knowledge. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Right. However, you don't have to promise me that you will eat that you, you have to promise me that you will eat lunch today and pay for it. Okay. Oh, you already got one of his? Okay, so they're propagating. Right. So the fact that this is really good when t equals zero, okay. What's the fact that there's no free lunch? The other one's not good. This is where the function fn is blowing up. Right? Mm. What if t is not near zero? Then, t, that part is bad. then this part is good. This part is good, and then this part is. So we break it up now, it should be clear why we break it up. So this is the integral, uh, the absolute value of t less than delta, having x minus t minus f of x fn of t dt plus the integral of the value of t is greater than or equal to delta of f of x minus t minus f of x fn of t dt. And so now I'm going to just highlight how the argument follows from here, what you do. So because my function is continuous, my function is bounded. So this in absolute value is not going to be too bad. This is non-negative. So continuous implies bounded. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do this depending on what's the weakest class of functions you want to look at. And so the contribution in absolute value will be less equal to Two times the bound, so say bounded by b, times the integral of fn, where t is greater than delta. And so I can then make that small by choosing delta and n sufficient. So you give me a delta, I can make this small. Okay? So the full details are in the chapter. I want to just give you the highlights right now. This is the fact that it's an approximation to the identity. So this is bounded by most 2b. If I put in absolute values, does it hurt if I put absolute values over fn? No. No. It's already non-negative. Absolute values don't affect it. So I just pull out a twice here. And now, because it's an approximation to the identity, you give me any epsilon and any delta, I can choose n so large that I can make that less than epsilon. So I can handle that piece. What about this piece? The difficulty is this could be quite large. But if t is small, what's true about this? Quite small. Quite small. So now I have to be careful. There's a fact I have not really used yet. Uh, periodic. periodic. Right. One thing that we could be careful about is maybe this one was at f of 1 half minus 0 0.0001, and this was now maybe f of negative one half plus point zero 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 one, and they were very far apart. But because my function is periodic, even if I'm at a wraparound point, I'm okay. So why do I know that this is uniformly small? I know by continuity, at any point x, there is a delta which depends on x, such that this will be less than epsilon. But why is my bound independent of x? So continuity tells me, you give me an epsilon, I can find you a delta, but the delta may depend on x. Is it uniformly continuous? It's uniformly continuous. Why is it uniformly continuous? I'm getting good periodic. But... Uh, periodic and one other thing, which is blatantly obvious. Continuous? Continuous. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You have to say it. Technically, on the green chicken this year, uh, one of the problems was not correctly graded. 
we did not make the students explicitly say there are infinitely many primes. Now, you know, if you're doing a math contest and you're willing to spend a couple of hours a day either driving to a math contest or just walking and doing a math contest, we'll assume you know there are infinitely many primes. Technically, you have to either prove there are infinitely many primes, quote the fact that there are infinitely many primes, or say, even if there are only finitely many primes, it still holds. Okay? No one took off points for this. Okay? Technically, you need to say, it's not just periodic, it's continuous and periodic, therefore uniformly continuous. So, periodic plus continuous implies uniformly continuous. Ah, now that it's uniformly continuous, you give me an epsilon and I can find a delta. And that delta is independent of epsilon. So that delta is independent of n, such that this is now less than epsilon in absolute value. So if this is less than epsilon in absolute value, if I put in absolute values, this part is at most epsilon in absolute value. What about this part? How large could this part be? One. Or no. No, it could no. be much larger than one. Remember, it's going off to infinity. No, you're part of the physics wing, right? It integrates to one. It integrates, uh, it integrates to one. That's what we want, right? It integrates to one. So this whole piece is going to be at most epsilon times something that integrates to one. Technically, it might not integrate to one because we're only going up to delta. doesn't matter, right? But everything is positive, you're just reducing the range of integration. Well, th this might not be positive over here. So when I put in absolute values, this piece is going to be at most epsilon, and now I'm integrating fn. So this is going to be less than equal to epsilon, and I can extend the integration to the whole range. And that integrates to 1. So it's technically not 3 epsilon the way I do it. I technically have 2b plus 1 epsilon. Right. <laughs> So, I have, but if I renormalize my function so that it's bounded by 1, I'm okay. Okay? So again, this is a standard 3 epsilon proof. Okay? So the idea is... I'm sorry? I only see 2 epsilons. Just pull an epsilon out of the B. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. There's your three epsilons. Okay? So this is a close cousin of a three epsilon proof. It's the same key idea. You break it up into different parts and use different techniques in each region. And that's the difficulty, is figuring out what you can use and where. And again, to unstop all there's no such thing as a free lunge. If this is really small, I could lose control of what's going on over here, and I have to balance things out. Okay? These are very standard arguments as you break things up into the places where they're close and places where they're Yes? Um, on your left side of your equation, when you're integrating f n of t and z, even if you don't integrate it over the... Where, where I call you over here? Or no, down, over here? Uh, up. Right here? Yeah, so like right there. Even if you don't integrate it over the full range, it can't be more than one. Correct. Okay. Exactly. And so when I increase it to the full range, I've only increased my error. Okay. But you, you're absolutely right that it's not going to be more than one, and that's all I need. Okay. okay. So this is phase theorem. We've now proven that the weighted Fourier series converge uniformly for a continuous periodic function. So there's two things you can do. One is you can start hacking away at the conditions of phase theorem. Do I really need the function to be continuous? What if the function is discontinuous? Do I still expect to have convergence? Well, if it's discontinuous, maybe there might be some issues at the point where I don't know where it's discontinuous. So in terms of you know, how far you can push things and still get a nice answer, if I want to have you know, convergence everywhere, continuity seems a reasonable condition. But what if you're willing to accept convergence almost everywhere? And you can greatly weaken this. You don't really need continuity. And so I'm not going to go into how far you can weaken these conditions. This is a good enough for what we're going to do. But if you're interested, try to explore how much you can weaken these. Uh, what I need to decide now is how much of Dirichlet's theorem to do. So based on the fact that you know, we have five minutes left, I really don't want to start a proof of Dirichlet's theorem. Dirichlet's theorem is essentially the same as phase theorem, except we have to be a little bit more careful because we don't have an approximation to the identity. And so we have to do a little bit more analysis. So if people want to see a proof of Dirichlet's theorem, email me. 
Otherwise, it's very similar to what we have here. It's in the book. There's not a fundamental new idea, except for the difficulty of handling what happens now when t is small. And essentially, when t is small, what does this look like? So we'll do that instead. Instead of actually proving Dirichlet's theorem, uh, what we'll do instead is I'll just highlight the key idea where you have to change something for Dirichlet's theorem. So obviously the letter F is replaced with the letter D. 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 Okay. It's the last time I want to see that letter in this class. Okay. So Dirichlet. What does that expression look like? when t is small. <clears throat> Looks like the derivative. Okay. What would make it look a lot more like the derivative? Divided by t. Okay. Can you just divide by t? No. No. Divide by t. You multiply by t over t. Multiply by t over t. So multiply <laughs> by t over t. And so now when you do that, this looks like the derivative. So what do you think is going to be a condition you need for Dirichlet's theorem for convergence of Fourier series? Derivative exists. Derivative exists at the point you care about. So it's going to be more than just continuity. So for Dirichlet's theorem, you want the function to be differentiable. In Fayer's theorem, we do not need differentiability. So that's a huge advantage of Fayer over Dirichlet. And you know, depending on how much time we have, I'll talk you exactly how much of an advantage that is. You actually don't even need differentiability. You need what's known as a Lipschitz condition. How many of you? I think this is C. Is there a C in Lipschitz? Yeah. Okay. So f of x minus f of y plus either the sum constant times x minus y. So this would be Lipschitz with exponent 1. If I had a 2 over here, well, then I could divide by 1 power of x minus y, and it would tend to 0. The function would be differentiable. And in fact, its derivative would be 0. So this does not imply that the derivative exists, but it does imply that the behavior is not that wild. Can anybody give me a function that is Lipschitz exponent 1, but not differentiable? Absolute value, excellent. So if I take the absolute value, I'll draw that so it doesn't look too far off the line, the only place where it's not differentiable is x equals 0. And if I calculate the limit from the right, I get 1. If I calculate the limit from the left, I get negative 1. It is Lipschitz there. And so even though this function is not differentiable, it's OK. And so you know, if you go through the proof, I believe you only need like a Lipschitz condition, not a differentiability condition. And then once you have something like that, then you can do a little bit more careful argument. You again break up what's going on into what's going on near the point t equals 0 and away from the point t equals 0. As an aside, one of the problems towards the end of the chapter actually constructs a continuous nowhere differentiable function. And um, you know, the first example, I believe, was due to Weierstrass. And the way I often see it phrased in books is, you know, Weierstrass distressed 19th century mathematicians by giving an example of a continuous function which is nowhere differentiable. Now again, if you think of a continuous function, well, you know, okay, yes, you can have like, you know, applications or something, but you know, for the most part, it should be smooth. You know, maybe a couple of absolute values in places. But instead, you can define a fractal pattern that, like, it keeps going back up and down. You can never... And in the end, it's continuous everywhere yeah. and nowhere differentiable. Things get even worse. If you take functional, anybody here take functional analysis? So you see like be a category theorem and stuff like that. There's ways to talk about sizes of spaces of functions. And when you look at the space of all functions, you can look at the space of continuous functions, and a subset of the space of continuous functions is differentiable functions. With probability one, if I choose a continuous function, not only is there at least one point where it fails to be differentiable, but it fails to be differentiable everywhere. Almost every function is, no, is uh, not differentiable anywhere. Now, 
most of the functions you look at in your life are differentiable almost everywhere. These are a very useful class of functions to look at. All right, so if people want to see a proof of Dirichlet, let me know. It's essentially the same as what we just did today with more bookkeeping. What we will do for next class is we will continue and we will move on to possibles and inequality, and we'll actually figure out the sum of 1 over n squared is pi squared over 6. We'll actually see a proof of that in the next class. Uh, we might get to the point where we start talking about Poisson summation. If not, that'll be the class after that.